Welcome to the video of the walk-around on MiG-23 Soviet aircraft fighter. The MiG-23 is very much fast airplane, many more than American slow aircrafts. This video will know you everything about the MiG-23 ever you could like to know. This video is sponsored by Flying Eyes, Air Models and Jones 360 coatings. Many thanks you for watching this amazing videos. I hope you likes and subscribes many times. Спасибо за просмотр. Ставьте лайки и подписывайтесь. Hello, my name is Dan Feiler. Normally I'm an A6 uh, attack guy, but today we're going to be talking about the uh, MiG-23. Uh, this is the MiG-23 UB version, the trainer variant of the uh, MiG-23 fighter. Um, like I said, my background is an A6 guy. Flew in the first Gulf War, 47 missions in the A6. I'm currently uh, captain with United on the A320, which is considerably different than this airplane. Uh, first of all, I'm not the authority the know-it-all of the MiG-23. I just happened to uh, acquire this one a few years ago and recently got checked out. So I'll tell you my, uh, my knowledge uh, as we go along. All right. Um, first of all, it is a um, classified experimental for exhibition. And appreciate the uh, FAA giving us a, a chance to actually bring these airplanes into the country and they slap the experimental uh, category on it. So we have a, a way to actually work within the rules in flying this airplane in the United States, since it's not a certified U.S. airplane. Uh, we'll start out with the uh, landing gear, uh, dual nose, uh, nose tires. Um, interesting uh, thing is here is these dimples on the tires, they're wear indicators. Uh, the, the tire will actually shed some cord during, uh, during the landings, and when these dimples are flush with the rest of the tire, then it's time to replace the tire. These are brand new. I just put them on and uh, haven't been flown yet, so they're, they're in very good condition. Um, and the gear retracts in, into, uh, uh, folds back up into the airplane. Uh, big hefty gear. It will continue our way forward. Uh, angle of attack gauge out here in the, near the radome. Um, pitot heat, pitot tube, and this is just a VHF antenna. This was a, an aftermarket piece that I had uh, installed. Um, I have another one uh, towards the back that we were able to uh, hook up with the Russian uh, avionics to make that one work. Uh, small little transponder IFF, that's an add-on also. Um, going, going to the front, what I was told is this uh, cool looking uh, instrument here is actually just a, like an ADF AM radio uh, antenna. And we have one on the back of the airplane that I'll point out as well. The nose cone section in the, uh, in the single seat uh, fighter versions, uh, they do have a radar, a big radar uh, in here. Uh, in the two seat variants, they, this is empty for a weight and balance and they'll get the radar training when they advance uh, to the single seat. But uh, in all two seaters, there's, there's no radar. Is that kind of an AOA from the top of for yaw? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's for yaw. Uh, what the, uh, like the Tomcats had the, the string they just had a piece of yarn on there, and, and it, would, it would move with the, the slip of the airstream. Uh, so this is a, it basically yeah, a yaw indicator. Don't really get to, get to see it very well from the cockpit, but it, it's there anyway. And then uh, the pitot tube, pitot static tube, of course they keep it way out in the front here, so it's uh, un, unobstructed from, from the airflow of the, uh, of the rest of the airplane. So it's a very pointy nose airplane. Coming around backside, pretty much more of the same. This is a, um, an alternate pitot-static tube up here on the right side of the cockpit. And coming back into the uh, intakes, uh, this may look like a very familiar intake. 
story goes, it's a direct copy of the F-4 Phantom. Um, the uh, Soviets had acquired a Phantom somehow, and they, they knew the performance, and it was a, a Mach 2 airplane, so they, they redesigned this, uh, they designed this by reverse engineering. Even the number of holes, I think there are like 1,060 holes in here, um, they're identical to, to the F-4 Phantom. Uh, this is a, so when the, when the air, air flow is coming in here, these, these ramps are movable. Um, when you're going supersonic, you don't want supersonic air going into your engine, so these ramps will slow the air down so basically it doesn't flow, uh, blow the flame out of your engine and stall the engine. So these ramps will move um, automatically uh, with the uh, increase and decrease of, of the aircraft. Um, on the back side, if you want to come around and, and look between the, the fuselage and this ramp here, you'll see uh, these splitter vanes, very sharp, uh, very sharp objects. And they were designed to cut the barricade when the aircraft would land aboard an aircraft carrier. Of course, this aircraft never did, but the F-4 Phantom did. Um, story goes, they reverse engineered it so well, they didn't know what they were for. They just knew they wanted them exactly like it. So when, when, if uh, the Phantom was to take a barricade, it wants the nose to go through the nylon mesh. And this would cut the barricade so it would trap the wing. It would cut the, uh, let the nose go through but you want the webbing to catch the, to catch the wings. So once again, they, they designed it exactly like the Phantom. They weren't sure why, but they did it anyway. So uh, split intake for the engine. This is just a single engine airplane. Uh, coming back, what they, they call these puffer doors. I believe they're on the MiG-21 also. Um, at uh, sitting on the ramp, idle power. If you don't have a lot of airflow coming through the front of the intake of the airplane, so these puffer doors, they're, not, uh, they're just free moving, they're not hydraulic or spring or anything like that. So the engine is, is trying to suck in more air, it'll actually suck it through the side here um, on pre-flight and during, um, when the engine started, guys still have to be wary of getting too close to this because it'll, it'll suck some, like your hat in or whatever. So you have to be careful with that. And then during the flight, when we got enough airflow coming through the front end and intake of the airplane, it, it'll they'll just, the airflow will, will close them off on you and they, they won't be used in flight. All right, coming back, we have um, <clears throat> five weapon stations on, uh, on this airplane. Um, this would be number two, and on the other side, number four, we also have a weapon station on the middle, uh, which could also be used for a fuel tank. And a little forward here is where the, um, the gun would mount. It would be a two-barrel, um, two-barrel 23 millimeter, and I, I believe it carries about 180 rounds. Uh, the gun on this airplane had to be taken off and uh, disarmed in order to get it through the uh, into customs uh, with the ATF here in the United States. Um, Where's your head? Hmm? Where's your head? This here? Yeah. Once again, I'm going to say the story goes because this is, this is what I heard. Um, this shape caused our intelligence community a lot of fits. They didn't know what it was. And they had not acquired an airplane yet. So they had only, only had to guess what this was. Um, it's nothing. This was designed to give our intelligence community fits. So um, there's nothing in there. It's just a shape. It looks cool. And uh, I think it's a pretty good story. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they may want to call it a, uh, a ECM pod or something like that. But uh, I haven't opened it up. But uh, there's, there's nothing in there. Um, a little further back, another weapon station here for uh, the wing. This is not the uh, movable part of the wing. Um, it's just uh, another, another hard point. As we uh, move back, um, so the wings are in the, uh, the wings have three main positions. Uh, 16 degrees is uh, all the way forward, and that's for takeoff and landing and cruising. Up at altitude, the cruising airspeed is 0.8 Mach, and that's the limitation of the wing forward. Um, if you want to go uh, point to point between here and Florida, you'd be just, that's the best economy. Probably like in the low 30s, 33,000 feet and uh, 0.8 Mach. Uh, if you want to go any faster, you're going to burn a little more fuel. Sweep the wings back, um, you'll burn a lot more fuel, uh, keeping it up on the step. Um, the next major position will be 45 degrees. And at 45 degrees, you can go up to 2.35 Mach. And uh, if you want to go even, uh, Accelerate a little more, look a little cooler, you can go all the way back to 72. Still, the uh, speed limitation is 2.35. So you can go up to the, the maximum speed of the airplane in 45 or 72. Um, and then 
it does carry fuel in the wings. And uh, this is uh, something on my pre-flight checklist uh, and in-flight. Um, you have to, when you want to refuel the wings, you have to move this with a, a screwdriver into the flight position. So I marked it so I don't forget. And then uh, when you refuel, you go to refuel and then when you come back to the flight. Um, otherwise, the fuel is going to be trapped in there. So first part of my checklist is, before I get in the cockpit, is make sure that's still in the flight position so I can get the fuel out of the wings. Otherwise, you're just carrying it around for the ride. Uh, it has uh, basically 1,100 gallons of fuel. Um, 44,000 uh, liters or so, and depending on what you're doing with the airplane, you can fly an hour, hour and a half with that. So it's not, it's not a Cessna <laughs> or a, a Citation jet. Uh, coming back to the landing gear, it's a whole lot of landing gear that fits into that small hole right there. Um, I don't know who designed it, but he was uh, very creative with all the hydraulics and. I, you know, I watched it a few times and I still don't know how it gets all this stuff in here. It's, it's a, a crazy bunch of gyrations and this will be the uh, uh, external part of the fuselage once it all closes up. They did use these uh, uh, airplanes, the Soviets were big on using unimproved uh, airfields. Uh, they would use roads, I don't know if they would actually take this off in the grass because it's so heavy, but a lot of their airplanes, were, you know, they could you know, fly them in a, uh, in a, in a grass strip. Uh, this airplane's a lot heavier, but it, they could, you know, take off and land on the highways, and there's, you know, quite a few videos of them, them doing that. Um, What's the weight? Uh, weighs about uh, 26,000 pounds. Um, if you had a light fuel load, you could get close to a one-to-one -one thruster weight ratio. Um, it's uh, uh, 15,000 pounds uh, thrust, uh, max power, 23,000 pounds in burner. So you're you're close to one-to-one -one if you have a, a lighter fuel load on it. Service was distilled water. This is uh, uh, for my air conditioning system. I just get a squeeze bottle, put some distilled water in there, squeeze it in there, and uh, it, it uses it for, for air conditioning. A uh, nice, nice little cool mist comes out even on a, a hot Texas day. So uh, I have to have a, my little bottle of distilled water here and the, the tank's just on the inside here. This would be the, the tank for it right here. And um, just looking at some of the lines, uh, yellow would be a fuel line, uh, black or silver could be a, an airline, brown would be for hydraulics. And these uh, red stripes are very important. I put them on because I think it looked good. It goes fast. All right. I thought it looked good. So, um, a little further back, this is the servicing unit for the uh, hydraulic system has a main system and a, and a booster system. Uh, one's a uh, inline, one's a return line. And at the end of the, end of the flight, there's a pressure built up and you just squeeze the red lever and uh, takes the pressure out of the hydraulic system. But it uh, has backup. The, both systems are uh, designed to work at the same time for, uh, they both run for uh, using the flight control surfaces. Um, if there was a, uh, uh, a failure in one pump, uh, the booster pump would take over and it won't it run, won't run all your systems but it'll get the gear down and you'll have uh, maneuverability so it'll get in a position where you can actually land uh, you won't be fully mission capable but it, it's just designed to get you out of the combat area and get you back back on the ground safely somewhere around uh, bring them up at 220 uh, you can bring them down at about 240 um, for for takeoff laps and uh, full flaps, uh, I come. I usually bring them down about 170. Come over the fence at 150, touchdown. Definitely no lower than 135. You're shooting for about 140, 145, you know, for for a touchdown. So yeah, it's no faster than the Airbus. <laughs> um, so as we work our way back, the. Uh, Many different words for these, other than just the uh, horizontal uh, fin, stabilizers, stabilators, uh, but it's just a one-piece uh, unit on both sides that doesn't have the hinge on the back like uh, slower airplanes do, but this is required for a supersonic flight, so you have the big movable surface in the back going up and down. I think the Brits uh, came up with that system. Um, so for, uh, for turning the airplane, when the wings are at 16 and 45 degrees, it uses a combination of um, 
flap rounds and stabilizers to turn the airplane. Uh, but when you go to 72 degrees totally, then it just uses the stabilizers themselves. Um, and going back, going back to the, uh, yeah, the, this has flap rounds. It doesn't have ailerons. Um, so it has uh, leading edge devices and flap rounds and flaps in the back. So a lot of stuff going on with the wing, even though it's moving, it still has all the, all the cool uh, control surfaces. Other things going on back here, we've got this uh, retractable tail fin. Um, <clears throat> when the gear is up, uh, this fin will rotate. It will pivot at this, at this joint here and here, and it will, it'll come down, and it gives you more stability. Um, the, you know, I guess uh, during the flight testing, it didn't have enough uh, vertical tail, so they uh, added, added more tail to the bottom. Um, so it's, it's just automatic. It's a direct mechanical linkage with, uh, with the gear. And when the gear comes uh, down, this fin will fold up. It doesn't give you a whole lot of ground clearance underneath. So I found that uh, aero braking is not, definitely not F-15 style. It's uh, a little more mild. You don't want to get the nose uh, parked up there too much. Um, but this will also come down in an emergency. It has a, uh, an alternate high pressure uh, blow down function. So uh, it'll still um, fold up when the, when the gear comes down so you don't scrape it in case, in case of emergency. Um, has uh, four speed brakes, uh, pedal speed brakes. These are the lower ones. And it's got an uh, upper one up uh, on top of the fuselage here. So they just uh, come out in the aft, um, just uh, on the fuselage by the engine. And we're coming back to the tail. If you look at the top of the tail, you'll see that same uh, ADF antenna. Um, and a couple, couple notches below that, it's just, these are just static, uh, static discharge wicks. And they have them all around the airplane just to take the static electricity off the airplane as it's flying through, builds it up. Coming back to uh, just below the, the vertical tail uh, is a clamshell door. And this is where they uh, have the drag chute for the airplane. Since I have to pack the drag chute and it's not that easy, uh, my, my rule of thumb is if I have 8,000 feet of runway, I'm not gonna use the drag chute unless it's an emergency. Um, it, it just takes about an hour to pack it and it's a, it's a pain in the ass. So, um, so no, normally you would just push a button by the throttle and it would pop this drag chute out. It would come out with the airstream. I think the limitation is about 198 knots on it. Uh, some guys have deployed it. Uh, just prior to touchdown, or you can play it safe and, and right at touchdown, bring it out. A couple things you can do is um, <clears throat> you can release it from the aircraft on the runway, but you just follow the runway, or you can taxi off and release it there. Or if you come up on the power a little bit, you will actually inflate the parachute behind you, the drag chute, and you can air taxi it back. Problem with that is if you make a tight turn, you may take a taxi light out or whatever, and then you just bought the county another uh, taxi light. So what I would do is just uh, clear the runway, uh, get on the taxiway, drag it, uh, cut it there, and, and then have somebody out come out and get it, pick it up for you. Um, and the problem with uh, if you're going to try to air taxi it, you're up on the power. The brakes on this airplane get hot real easy, really fast. I would say out of uh, that, that seems to be the biggest issue that I've had with the airplane. It has these uh, fuse plugs at a certain temperature. They'll, they're designed to release the pressure uh, so you don't actually blow the tire. Um, but the brakes get very hot on the two-seaters. They have brake fans on them, and uh, they do an okay job, but they don't always cool the brakes uh, like, you would, uh, like you really want. Um, the, uh, the Soviets and some of the other countries would have a, a trough full of water that they would taxi through and cool the brakes down using water. Seems like an engineer's nightmare that you're putting cold water on hot brakes, but this is what they did and it seems to work. And I've done it here too. I come back and I just get out the garden hoses and, and, uh, and start cooling them down. Uh, they don't crack. They looks, looks weird, but last a long time with steam coming off. So, um, Or you can put uh, brake cooling fans. I have some portable fans that I put on there too. So use the drag chute. That'll, that'll keep your brakes a little bit cool. And if you don't, then you gotta, you gotta be careful about the, the hot brakes. Um, coming back to the uh, back to the airplane, the, the exhaust is one big tube back here. Uh, deep inside is uh, the afterburner section with the flame holder and um, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the exhaust nozzle here is actually controlled by uh, hydraulically, but 
it's, it's using fuel uh, instead of uh, oil, hydraulic oil. So these, uh, these, these pedals move back and, uh, back and forth, depending on where you put the throttle. Uh, and this would be actually where, uh, this would be the condition of it right now if you had a full afterburner, they would open up, um, spit a 60 foot flame coming out the back. Uh, and then when you come out of burner, they'll constrict. Um, the rule is you have to, uh, on takeoff, you have to get to about 324 knots before you come out of burner. Uh, just in case they don't constrict, it gives you enough time to go over and flip the switch and do it manually. So you've got about 324 knots to about, you'll be slowing down to about 250 knots on, on a, a reduced power. So it gives you some, some time. So it's pretty cool that uh, I take off in burner and there's no airspeed limitation for me when I, when I use burner on takeoff here because operational necessity dictates I have to accelerate to 324. I just advise the tower before, before taking off. Gear speed, how fast do you gotta get the gear up? Uh, gear comes up about 150. But, and then, then you bring on flaps, like I said, about 221, and uh, just keep on accelerating to, uh, to 324. And uh, there's a min burner section, a max burner, but you can just come out to 100%, make sure that the, uh, you still have your 100% your power. Um, but if, if you don't, you'll, you'll notice the airspeed decrease pretty quick, and then you're just gonna have to go down and, and manually retract the nozzles and the switch in the cockpit. And uh, coming around uh, the other side is, uh, Pretty much all the same as the first side we talked about. It does have batteries. You can battery start the uh, APU, but they call it a turbo starter. It has an intake door and ex an exhaust door here. Uh, these are down right now because it knows it needs to have, have them open right now for, uh, for start. And once the, once the uh, turbo starter starts and the engine's running, these doors will close. Um, <clears throat> for engine cooling, it has these little pucks. Um, and it create a little airflow. There's, you can just push them in. There's a little spring on them, and this is just for uh, engine cooling. And they're, they, I think they have them on the MiG-21 also. There's a whole bunch of them. We have a single point refueling uh, capability here too, uh, which is very interesting that it's, uh, it's capable, uh, compatible with U.S. single point refueling, and as well as the. Uh, uh, electrics, the AC and the DC ports are compatible with, with US and the, the idea was whoever took over whoever could use, st still use the infrastructure to maintain their airplanes. So um, it, was a, it was a good idea, it was a good idea and that way I don't have to create any adapters. But usually I haven't, I haven't used the single point refueling, I do uh, over, over wing refueling. I have uh, three fuel tanks. Uh, on top that I usually fill up. I can get more fuel in the airplane and know exactly what I put in. Sometimes with the single point refueling, even though it has a gauge here, it, it's, it's not, not that reliable. Um, so I can tell when I fill up the, the, the top, I can see the fuel and I said, okay, it really has it. And it's very important this airplane because it doesn't have a true fuel gauge like we're used to. It has a gauge that you tell it how much fuel you think is in the airplane. So it doesn't have floats in it and says, ooh, you have this much fuel. You, know, you dial in, if, if I totally fuel the airplane, I know I have 4,000 liters in it, so I put 4,000 on the gauge, and it subtracts from there. And there's a series of lights that tell you, oh, your, your fourth tank is empty, your wings are empty. So you kind of keep a track of, of how it's going. But it doesn't have a fuel gauge, per se. Um, and the hydraulic service point, uh, port, again, for the, uh, the backup hydraulics, the main was on the other side. Um, servicing for the engine, uh, fuel filter and oil filter, and um, turbo starter. And we're working our way back to, back to the front. And this will be the, uh, the port for the uh, uh, DC power. As you civilian guys know, it's, a, it's the same, same adapter. We'll go check out the cockpit and uh, do a walk around on top. Yeah. So, this is the 
cockpit of the MiG-23 UB. Uh, the first, first thing, as you mentioned, the, uh, the green, um, bluish tint to it. I guess the Soviets had done uh, some research and it says it supposedly has a calming effect uh, on the pilot. All is well, you're not going to die. <clears throat> so, um, when I first got the airplane, I had stickers everywhere to, to say what the switches were. Uh, some of them were correct, some of them were not. But over the last few years, I've replaced most of the stickers and had things translated in English uh, with the help of my Bulgarian friend. Um, so I think I know where everything is now. At least it's, it's labeled mostly correctly. Um, I do have hot seats in these uh, new cartridges. So uh, the ejection, ejection handles here. I'm always uh, cognizant of that, making sure I don't inadvertently pull them. And you would have to uh, squeeze them compress these uh, parts here, and then rotate at your elbows and uh, pull them up. And a control stick, it's a hydraulic uh, control stick. And the uh, trigger button here, if you're firing the, uh, the guns, uh, fold it over and pull it. And trim switch on the top for your thumb. Red switch is for release, releasing bombs. And the black switch underneath, I believe, is for the uh, moving reticle in the, uh, in the gun sight, which I had removed uh, so I could actually see out. I don't need the gun sight. Uh, the uh, handbrake is uh, the Russian design. It's typical in, in this, this type of uh, this era airplane. It's just, uh, I, I, I call it a bicycle handbrake. And um, uh, this aircraft does have nose wheel steering so you don't have to use uh, differential braking like you do on some uh, other Russian airplanes. But if you just want to stop straight ahead, center the rudder pedals and uh, go ahead and squeeze. It uses air pressure to activate the hydraulic brakes. Um, there's a gauge over here by your right knee, not easy to see, but the, I do have uh, normal uh, air pressure on this needle. And then there's a uh, backup air pressure here. And if I was to squeeze the brake, you would hear the, uh, the brakes activate using the air pressure. Sounds like a semi truck. Yeah. Um, so we can uh, go around the cockpit. Um, back on this side, uh, the uh, connections for your uh, G suit and oxygen uh, would be uh, these connections down here. Uh, also, an emergency, uh, emergency oxygen bottle if you were to eject. Um, that's what the, the red knob is also for. The, the throttle system on this is a slide. It's not around the horn like in typical airplanes, um, uh, US airplanes. So to go forward, you gotta collapse this uh, button right here and then bring the throttle forward. You bring it all, all the way forward to be 100%. If you wanna go into an afterburner, once again, you gotta click this knob and then it'll go forward to a minimum burner. You click it again and you can go all the way to uh, maximum burner and that would be uh, all the way forward. To come out of burner, you can come back to here. It's still going to be in min burner until you release the, um, the this clicker switch again, and then you can come back, and it will come back to uh, approach idle. And to shut the engine off, you have to do a thumb switch here, and it brings all the way back to uh, to fuel cutoff. Um, Back on here, uh, normal engine start uh, switch is in the uh, up position. And then this is a, ba a bank of switches here for um, basically uh, fail switches. And uh, you can turn your anti-skid off. The emergency nozzle control we talked about, uh, if the uh, aircraft doesn't come out of, out of a burner, the nozzles don't constrict, you can uh, flip the switch down and uh, do that manually. Uh, emergency engine control, if your fuel control unit is not working right, and emergency drive, hydraulic drive. Like I said, it has two, two uh, the main system and the booster system. If you just wanted to go directly to the booster system, you could do that. There's an in-flight start switch that uses oxygen. It blows some oxygen into the engine. And then you can do an air start from there if the engine failed on you. We talked about um, uh, pulling the drag chute and uh, disconnecting the, the drag chute. Here's the, to deploy the drag chute is this button right here. So you, you'd come back to uh, idle on the throttle, and then you could just hit this with your, with your thumb and it would deploy the drag chute on you. 
Uh, coming up a little closer, um, gear handle. Uh, and in your indicating lights here, we could turn some of those on. Uh, three down and three green. So that right now the gear is down. And Russian and these type of airplanes, when the gear is up, you see three red lights. And you're flying around with three red lights all the time when the gear is up. It's kind of disconcerting. Usually red is bad, but in this case, you'll see the three red lights all the time. Then it has a, a speed brake switch and flap switch. Also has um, a fire switch here to uh, dump the uh, fire extinguisher into the engine compartment if necessary. This is a, uh, a lock switch for the, for the gear. Looks like a little boot. You flip it up and that way you can bring the gear up and down uh, once you get in flight. Uh, emergency brake. You can't set the brake, but you can pull it out and you'll still hear the same air pressure. But you have to sit there and hold the brake. You know, like I said, it doesn't set. Uh, G meter. It uh, seven and a half G's is the max G when the uh, wings are all the way back to 72 degrees, and with the wings are forward, it's uh, just around four and a half G's. Um, it has a yaw damper uh, for that. Um, angle of attack gauge, uh, really good to have that. Um, so just you have to use caution not to get into the uh, into the red zone or use the caution into the yellow zone. I did have some uh, avionics just. Uh, Panel mounted uh, handheld, but I, I mounted it in the panel GPS radios just to make them uh, FAA compliant. Gyros, same as like the L39 in the, in the MiG-21. 20, uh, MiG uh, airspeed indicator, add a zero for uh, knots, so that'd be 150 knots, 200 knots. Altimeter, pretty standard. Uh, then we got down to the Mach meter, and you'll see uh, Mach 2.35 would be way over here. Uh, the gauge goes up a little higher than you should be flying. Bottom left uh, over here, that's we talked about the emergency gear extension, and that's the handle for that. Coming over to the old Russian clock. Um, needles for like uh, autopilot. We have radio. A wing position indicator right here it says that the wings are all the way back, and it also tells you your limitation. 2.35 Mach and uh, 14 knots uh, it would be the corresponding number. There's not a whole lot of engine instrument gauges. Uh, the Russians are uh, um, kind of keen on that. They just uh, make it very simple. You have a high pressure turbine gauge and low pressure turbine gauge in this. Um, the number two needle is actually hiding behind it. Exhaust gas temperature gauge, good indication of how well your, your engine performance is. And this is a fuel gauge that we talked about. Um, so right now, I have about 1,600 uh, liters of fuel in it. And if I filled it up, I would just adjust the gauge to 4,000. And as the engine would run, it would subtract what it thinks it uh, used, and you would see the gauge start to come down. Um, it has a series of lights. Right here is the fourth tank light. That would be the first light that would, would come on. And there's only a couple hundred gallons in that. This light would come on, and you look at your gauge and go, Okay, that, that seems about right. I should have 3,500. Then the wing tanks would be the next one to, uh, to burn out. And then you have tank three and tank one and a service tank. So you, you, you watch the fuel ladder come down as, as you're doing it. Um, I have a bunch of idiot lights up here that were recently translated to, uh, to English. Um, if you hit it straight on, you'll see there's uh, different lights for uh, uh, maximum burner. Um, the wings need to be extended. Might have a tough time to see those, but you check all these lights prior to take off, and if uh, idiot light comes on during flight, you break out your checklist and you uh, find the appropriate page and you go go for it. Um, back over here is their form of the uh, circuit breakers, and for engine start, um, you actually to, to do engine start, you turn the battery switch on, AC DC generator, the start inverter, turn the service tank on, and then you push this button. Everything comes alive. It's pretty much a, a self-starting airplane once you put the throttle uh, to idle. And then uh, coming for a little further back, they have the, uh, the circuit breakers under the glass that are set in a, uh, a certain position. And uh, pretty much the glass is there because they're uh, no-touch items, and you shouldn't have to um, touch those during flight, so they keep, the, keep them guarded with the, the glass cover. Um, 
there's emergency canopy jettison here, for, uh, which would be the first part of the ejection. Um, it would be automatic if you ejected, or you could just blow the canopy off itself just by moving that lever forward. And the normal way for getting in and out is uh, a canopy handle on the left side. Yeah. All right. Or don't sit in the cockpit that long. Right. I flew back here for 15 minutes once, and I said I'd never fly back here again. <laughs> but Z said, hey, I don't want anything for the check ride. Just uh, let me fly in the front once. I go, oh, damn it. <laughs> so I guess I guess I'll have to sit back here one more time. <clears throat> so uh, welcome. It's like an airport around here. All right, welcome to the back seat of the uh, MiG-23 UB trainer variant. Uh, it's also affectionately called the uh, coffin. Uh, very very poor visibility back here. There is uh, some a little bit of side glass here, and you can see a little bit. Uh, to the left of the pilot's head and not much to the right of the pilot's head at all. Um, a lot of airplanes, uh, when they're first manufactured, you know, they're, the single seat's manufactured and the two seater's uh, kind of like an afterthought. Uh, so they would move fuel tanks around because that's a big empty space. And they'd, they'd throw a cockpit in here. So it's not designed to be um, really user friendly, and it's not. So the instructor would sit back here, the student would sit in the front. The instructor has overriding controls of uh, things like gear and uh, brakes and a skid. Um, and basically on, on this instructor control panel here. Um, because the vis visibility is so bad and it, this cockpit does not sit higher than the, the front cockpit, they use a periscope system, which uh, will come down. It's a, located at the top of the canopy. So the, this mirror rotates forward and on top of the canopy, it will rotate up um, so it looks, it appears that you're looking through this periscope, it looks like you're looking right through the guy's head in front of you. And it's, uh, it works really well. Um, but it's, a, it's attached, uh, um, it's limited by, by the airspeed because it's, it's not aerodynamic at all because it comes up uh, moving forward. So when the, when the gear comes up, the periscope has to come down. And, uh, but if you have it in automatic, then uh, as soon as you drop the gear, the periscope comes up so the, the guy in the back seat can actually see what's going on for, for landing. Otherwise, he's just looking out. Um, it may be good as you're coming through the 90 or so, but once, you, once your roll wings level to forward visibility, it's just terrible. So a lot of, uh, it's, it's pretty busy back here. You, you have a lot of switches. Um, he can induce failures uh, to the guy in the front and, and induce a navigation failure. He can depressurize the, the cockpit and see how the, the student in the front would work, uh, work, work the problem. Still got some of the original Russian gauges, uh, radios back here. Um, did fly over Eglin uh, Air Force Base and some of these came alive, uh, which was, was pretty cool. Um, yeah, but uh, that was kind of a little thrill there. But pretty much the, the same deal as uh, what's in the front, just uh, any instructor would have to sit here and suck it up for the flight. And, and that's why I don't like being back here. <laughs> 